So welcome to the hot health and care hot topics. See what I did there? Anyway, I'll give up. Um, it's a lovely warm day in London for those that are watching online. Our first speaker is Louise Pryor from Calund Consulting. Uh, she will be doing our first session, which is on impact of climate change on health. So Louise has had a varied career as an actuary, software engineer, and an academic. She currently works as a consultant, specializing in climate change and insurance, and social security and pensions in developing markets. She's a member of council and is just about to take over as chair of the Resource and Environment Board. So over to Louise. Thank you. Um, lovely to be here. Nice to see so many people. Um, the environment is a really important factor in our health. The um, WHO says that 23% of worldwide deaths and 22% of the disease burden worldwide is down to the environment. So the environment really matters. And of course, climate change is a major force acting on the environment. So climate change is bound to affect health. And the question is, how will it feed through? This is a really short talk. I've been told 15 minutes, and he's pretty firm, I tell you. Um, so I can only possibly give a summary. There's rather more detail in my paper, which is available on the website, but that in itself is only about a 20-page summary of about three or four major reports, each of which are, say, three or 400 pages long. However, my paper does provide signposts to these other major reports. So if you want more detail, look, go first to my paper and then follow up the references from there. I'm really, really just going to skim over the surface this evening. So here are some of the effects of climate change on health that have been identified. And you can see that there's a huge range here. Um, varying from things that you'd automatically think of, such as temperature-related deaths, to some other ones that you might not have necessarily thought of. And there are also indirect e effects, which um, I haven't necessarily listed here and that we'll um, be talking about later on. This is where climate change might cause large-scale alterations to Earth natural systems, um, so there might be effects on food and water security, population displacement and so on, which themselves can have knock-on effects on health. And this is going to be one of the themes of my talk, is that it's all actually very complex. There's a lot of different things going on that affect each other in different ways. And if you really want to understand it, you have to realise this and realise just what a complex system we're talking about. So to see that, we can first see that, in fact, the effects of climate change on the environment are themselves pretty complex. This is, um, these, these pictures show um, temperature, changes in temperature uh, on, across the top row and precipitation across the bottom row. And um, down the columns, the left-hand side is a scenario where there's a two-degree increase in average global, global temperature, which is going to require a lot of action from governments, from society as a whole, to keep the increase down to two degrees. And the column, the sort of column on the right shows a scenario which is pretty much business as usual, what will happen if no real changes are made. And we can see here that the effects vary really quite a lot, A, between the scenarios, obviously, but also by location. So it's going to depend very much where you live as to what the actual effects are going to be. Um, and the effects are even more varied at a scale sort of below that seen on these pictures. So your individual local sort of microclimate al almost is, is going to um, have a huge influence on what the effects are. Now, of course, the effects don't come through, or they do come through as higher average temperatures or whatever, but what they really come through as are changes in weather. It's weather that really affects our day-to-day -day lives and affects health, too, as we'll see. 
And one way of looking at this is through the Actuaries Climate Index, which has been developed by the North American Actuarial Associations and has six components for different aspects of the weather. High temperatures, low temperatures, um, high precipitation, drought, high winds, and sea level. And these are the, I'm sorry, the laser, the laser pointer doesn't work, so I can't point things out. Um, this is all described in a bit more detail in my paper, but again with the references where you can look this up to, to see more. And you can see that um, since 1990 or so, the, um, the black line gives the overall index on this chart. And you can see that on the whole, these extremes of, of weather, and admittedly sea level isn't really weather, but you can see that the um, extremes have been getting more frequent over the last um, 20, 30 years. So, um, well, um, by the way, this is something the Actuaries Climate Index at the moment is just, just covers North America, the US and Canada, but we are looking to see whether it can be extended to cover the UK and Europe. But this is all very well. This is looking at um, the climate and then at weather and how does this then feed through to health? Well, it feeds through in some very complex ways indeed. Um, firstly, of course, environmental conditions. So high temperatures have a direct effect on health, as we're maybe going to see a bit later when, when Ravi gives her talk. But also, um, high temperatures can affect, for example, the breeding conditions for disease vectors such as mosquitoes. Precipitation and so on uh, uh, affect those things too. However, these direct environmental effects are um, mediated by social and political conditions, so it depends on what the healthcare system is like, um, whether the politicians put disease control measures in place, whether they put, for example, mosquito control measures in place. Um, and this, of course, is affected by economics too, whether they can afford to do it. Um, and um, by and changing demographics <coughs> also have an influence. And all these things then interact in extremely complex ways. So economics can depend on what the social and political conditions are, which themselves are then affected by the economic conditions and the demographics. So you've got complex interactions and um, a lot of feedback mechanisms going on. So it's very, very difficult to predict what, what might actually happen, especially given the uncertainty of the underlying um, detailed effects of the climate change. So what I'm saying here is it's all absolutely fascinating. I mean, it really is, but it's not terribly easy to work out exactly what's going to happen. So what this means is that you're going to get both um, direct and indirect effects of climate change on health. Uh, and also, of course, some effects are going to be beneficial. So, for example, in the UK, um, it's entirely possible, there's some argument about the exact size of the effect and so on, but it's entirely possible that the um, number of cold-related deaths might decrease. That, of course, actually depends on other factors such as changing demographics because it's older people who are more susceptible to cold-related um, deaths and so on. But so, you know, on the other hand, there will certainly be more heat-related deaths and which will outweigh the other and so on. You've got in temperate climates such as Britain, people may become more active as the weather becomes more, as it becomes more pleasant to be outside. So they may have better vitamin D uptake and they may be more physically active. So there are, there are some potentially beneficial effects as well. Um, the other thing is that um, actions that are taken in order to adapt to climate change and to mitigate climate change might have effects. So one of the chief mitigation mechanisms is to try and cut back on emissions of various gases, and that could, for example, improve um, the air we breathe, which will have a, a knock-on effect on health. On the other hand, some of the adaptation mechanisms, which um, in Britain, for example, involved 
trying to cut fuel consumption by providing better insulation, both domestically and in hospitals and care homes, so that it's warmer in the winter without having to spend so much on heating and without having to pump so much carbon into the air in order to heat these places up. This higher insulation can mean that they then overheat more in the summer so that you get more heat-related deaths and illness in the summer from that reason. So again, there's a lot of complexity going on and you can't say just because it's on average getting warmer, um, you, you can't tell what the detailed effects are going to be on all the different types of health conditions. Um, there have been, um, one of the things that happens in the UK is that every five years, that's what's called the climate change risk assessment, which the government um, has to produce by law. And what happens is that in order to produce that, there's a big evidence report sort of underlying all the risk assessments. And um, one volume of that, so this, this comes in several volumes, one volume, not a particularly small volume, covers various factors including health and um, other sort of, um, sort of human society things. And this is where most of the information in, in my paper and in this talk comes from on the impacts in the UK. So that you can see some fairly obvious things that um, death and injuries from flooding. Flooding turns out to be um, sort of one of the major um, climate change related risks in the UK. That results directly in injuries. It also has indirect effects and it turns out that the, the operational risks of flooding can be quite severe because a lot of health facilities, hospitals, GP surgeries, whatever, are themselves subject to flooding so that that will reduce the availability of health care. And the chaos caused by flooding, as well as possibly making it more difficult for patients to get to health care facilities, also makes it more difficult for the staff, for the health care staff to get to the facilities. So again, reduces the level of health care available. And with all these things, you have to think of the effect on people's health directly, but also what the operational effects are on the healthcare system, for example, and how that can then affect the overall picture. In the US, you'll see a somewhat similar list. Um, the report that this is all based on has a slightly different purpose to the UK report. Um, they don't classify things in the same way. So, for example, you'll see uh, mental health and well-being appear as a separate item on this list. In the UK, that's taken into account in the... Um, it's sort of treated in with the effects of flooding, for example, that that's known to have bad effects on people's mental health and well-being. So, although this list looks a bit different, um, some of that difference is just down to a difference in classification. However, I think some of the other differences are because the US is a much larger and more geographically diverse country than the UK is. And as we saw, the effects of climate change on, um, sort of in, of, of lo on local conditions can vary quite widely. And so because the US covers such a large geographic range, there's going to be more variation in the local effects of climate change. So that's another reason for the difference. And of course, they, um, the southern US in particular um, is, is sort of verging towards the subtropical re regions and um, where there are going to be a lot more significant effects on disease vectors and so on than there are um, in our chilly northern climes. Overall, worldwide, um, it's difficult to draw generalizations. What we can say is that the effects are likely to be more severe in the tropics and in the polar regions. This is, again, because the direct climate impacts tend to be more significant in those regions. Um, you also see some of the poorer countries, especially in the tropics, 
and they, of course, have less developed healthcare systems and are likely to be less able to put disease control mechanisms in place. So that's not going to be helpful. Um, and also, we see in both those regions more communities depending directly on the environment for their sustenance, so more subsistence-based communities. And this is true both in the tropics and in polar regions. Um, and those types of communities, as well as being poorer, so less access to healthcare and so on, are also, of course, the, the, the um, impact of environmental change is felt much more severely. And also the indirect effects that we've mentioned before. That, sorry, that's my um, 15 minutes up. So I'm very, very nearly finished. Um, the indirect effects that, that we were talking about, the effects on food security, water security, population displacement and so on, those again, it is thought, are likely to be much, much more severe in the less well-off countries because they're going to be less able to handle the effects. So overall, um, my feeling is that we in Britain are comparatively lucky. We will get some effects, but they're not likely to be um, the, the extent and, and um, sort of depth that are going to happen in other parts of the world. Now, what does all this mean for actuaries? I have to kind of bring this bit in, really. Um, and I was told when these slides were reviewed, well, this all seems a bit bland. It's complicated and models have many assumptions. But actually, what I mean is it's incredibly complex. Um, in some ways, more structural modeling, you know, trying to tease out the effects of, of, of you know, the, the, all the pathways and so on would be helpful, but it's, it's really, really difficult to do. Um, how do you handle all these social and economic um, conditions in the models? And I think my main thing is that as actuaries, we have to be very, very aware of the limitations of our models. And I suspect a lot of these models that we're seeing have a lot of implicit assumptions. And because it's so complex, you really have to think carefully about whether these implicit assumptions, which tend to assume no change on some important dimensions, such as, for example, the availability of health care, um, are those assumptions likely to be warranted? It's likely, especially if we think about the economic transition um, to a low-carbon economy, that that is going to have quite significant economic impacts, which then will affect the availability of health care and the willingness of politicians to provide health care um, so that these sort of knock-on effects, these complex interactions, I suspect will prove to be pretty important and I suspect that most of the models do not account for them. So be very, very wary is my advice on that. And that really is what I've got to say. That's that's when I finish. Thank you very much. Um, we will go, we're going to change the programme slightly and we'll do a Q&A for each session. So we've got a few minutes for some questions for Louise. So if anyone's got a question, please hand up and wait for the mic and then your name first and then the question. Thank you, Louise, for a very interesting talk. Sorry, Nico Aspinall. <laughs> I failed instantly. Um, thank you very much, Louise, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm, I'm really struck at how some of the, the reports you were talking about and maybe less about actuarial topics and rates and potentially more guidance for policymakers as to how to mitigate some of these effects. Um, I wonder if you could just comment on maybe whether you've seen how well this is integrated into government policy, either in the UK or the US, which were your, your case studies. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Nico. Um, I think it... I'm going to say it varies, aren't I? Um, um, I think in some parts of government in the UK, people are very, very aware of it. In others, they're not. 
So, for example, um, the CCRA, the Climate Change Risk Assessment, does point out an increase in temperature-related deaths due to overheating is really quite likely, but the um, local planning regulations, of course, come from all different um, local governments, <coughs> you know, various counties, cities, whatever, and the pressure on them is to construct, is to get more housing built, and they are very, very unwilling to put more constraints on the housing that can built because their targets are basically expressed in terms of build houses rather than will those houses um, drown or, or roast people to death. Um, worldwide, there's a very interesting report which has just been issued. It was issued after I wrote this paper and after I completed these slides, but if anyone wants to Google Emerging Markets Symposium, Environment Health, you will find a major report on the environmental effects on health in emerging markets. They have a list that long of recommendations for governments about what can be done. Um, and the fact that the list is that long, I think, tells you something about what governments are currently doing about it. Second question. Yeah. Uh, Scott, Scott Reid. Um, yeah, just picking up the point about the ins back to the insurance and actually it's what they have to worry about. Um, for some business lines like motor or home, it's an immediate issue because you've got flooding and that can impact these sort of business lines. Uh, health and care, um, what sort of time scales? You're talking about this, the, the modelling that's been done on this. Um, what type of, sort of time scales are we talking about for health, health and care actually to worry about the mortality and morbidity rates? Um, I, th I think the, the time scales actually vary by the type of effect. So um, things like um, mosquitoes coming into Britain it, it, and, and different disease vectors, it actually depends on the disease vector um, as, as to when the, the climatic conditions will change. Um, I am not good on the detail of this. You need to, I'm afraid, go back to the original reports and look at it. I do wonder whether Rabia is not going to have something to say uh, about I, that. I think I might. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I've got, I've got a question while everyone's mulling over another one. So um, my question was actually going to be about whether you were on balance, how you thought the UK was going to be, but I noticed you said we'd be lucky well, um, compared, compared to others. Yes. Yeah. So that was my point. So um, how, how lucky would the US be compared to UK, for example? I don't know. Um, I think quite a lot depends on the political outlook. Um, I suspect they will have more problems just because they have the more extreme climatic and weather conditions than we do. So, for example, they already suffer more from um, windstorms. I mean, they get the hurricanes, we don't get the hurricanes, for example. Um, so, with those sorts of things, the, any change in that is going to affect them much more than it affects us. Um, and whether the politicians are going to be prepared to put disease control measures in place, or whether they actually have the mechanisms that they can do that for some of the vector-borne diseases, for example. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions over there? Okay, we'll have a chance, hopefully, for some Q&A at the end if there's anything else, but I think if we can say thank you very much to Louise first. <laughs> So our second speaker is uh, Rabia Nakwi. She's from University College Dublin. She graduated in 2001 with a first class degree in maths from Trinity College. She, since then she's been in actuarial consultancies which have required significant mathematical skills to quantify ever present risks. Uh, in particular uh, as a senior actuarial consultant with Willis Towers Watson and other versions of Willis Towers Watson over the time. <laughs> Ten years is, well, how many, com anyway, quite a few companies. Um, she's currently p uh, pursuing a PhD in actuarial science in the School of Mathematics and Statistics at University College Dublin. 
So it's over to uh, Rabia. Thank you. So thank you very much, Nick. Um, it, it's my pleasure, albeit with some trepidation, uh, to be presenting before you this evening. Uh, the topic of this uh, presentation um, uh, is driven uh, concerns and exposure analysis uh, governed primarily by this question, climate change, reshaping mortality differences within the United Kingdom. Being an exploratory uh, analysis, it uses a simple model. Uh, simplicity always should precede uh, complexity, in, uh, to my mind, um, to kind of uncover some general trends um, and features. Um, uh, so why don't we let, uh, jump straight into it? Whilst, whilst this is a health and care event, there is no, be no more, there is no more an unambiguous measure of health than mortality. Accordingly, what are some of the assertions that can be made with respect to mortality, particularly in the context of climate change? Well, age matters, with the older age group tending to be the, those that are most severely impacted by climate change. Geography matters. Um, in the UK, Scottish mortality is significantly higher than mortality in England and Wales. And the usual suspect for explaining this disparity would be the socioeconomic argument. And of course that's true, but increasingly it's becoming less able to explain uh, the regional mortality differences such that consideration of environmental influences is necessary. Um, uh, so for that reason, it's necessary. Now, the climate in England and Wales, like Dublin or uh, Ireland, is much akin to uh, an assault course. You know, many ups and downs. Um, uh, and actually, it can be worse in Scotland. Um, uh, so Scotland is generally wetter, windier, and colder. Allied with this is empirical evidence that suggests uh, from studies dating as far back as uh, the 1970s, the Bull and Morton uh, study, uh, uh, more recent findings from the Euro Winter Group and various epidemiological studies that suggest a U-shaped temperature mortality relationship in operation in the UK. Um, that is to say that there is an optimal temperature range in which mortality is quite is reasonably low and at either side it then seems to accelerate. In fact, this relationship is noted in other countries too, although they have different optimal temperature range and I suppose that speaks to uh, of man's ability to adapt. Uh, so that is to say that temperature being a uh, thermal measurement of climate change also <coughs> matters. So delving a little bit further along those lines, what else, uh, what else do we know? Well, um, the elderly population in the United Kingdom uh, as of mid-2015 represented 18% um, uh, of the population. Um, um, and this group, which is also the over 65s, the, this group, which is also most severely impacted by weather and by climate, um, is also a primary group of interest when it comes to uh, life policies, pension policies, and so on. Um, uh, the contract periods for such contracts, uh, for such uh, policies, um, are such that climate change can have a potentially material impact on the outcomes and therefore the liabilities. So um, here we see that the temperature differences between England and Wales uh, and Scotland are actually changing, in fact increasing. Uh, it's true to say that in both regions temperatures are increasing. Uh, however, uh, the, temp the rate of temperature change in central England is uh, far exceeds that in uh, Scotland. Um, uh, and so that, and so that uh, uh, kind of, uh, from this melting pot, uh, sort of arises a very natural question. Um, with climate change representing an ongoing disruption 
what could that mean for regional mortality disparities pertaining to our group of interest? So to tackle this question, um, i.e. to uh, model older age and mortality with temperature um, uh, data, uh, we made use of population estimates sourced from the Human Mortality Database, uh, select uh, monthly death data provided by the ONS and National Records of Scotland uh, in respect to the period uh, 1995 to 2014 in order to model older age and mortality. Additionally, temperature data uh, was sourced from the Met Office Hadley Center in respect of central England in order to represent the climate or the weather uh, of England and Wales, and data from selected weather stations, from selected Scottish weather stations, was used to uh, represent uh, the climate of Scotland and to facilitate comparability. Um, moreover, UK climate projections, so-called UK CP09, trips off the tongue, uh, was the source of climate change information that underlay uh, scenario analysis, and we'll take a look at that later. But using the data, modeling was conducted uh, using a GAM framework, uh, generalized additive models, um, represent, uh, representationally not so different from GLMs. Except, as, uh, as uh, Louise highlighted, uh, they don't come with the complexity of, or the implicit assumptions of GLMs. We're freed from that. Um, so uh, it allows me to, it allows more flexibility to re relate multiple variables to the response without having to predefine uh, uh, those relationships or make those uh, assumptions. In other words, I work non-parametrically. Um, I was going to show you a whole bunch of, a bunch of stuff on GAMS, but uh, after uh, giving a sort of a mock presentation, I decided let's leave it out. Uh, so that brings us to the model, uh, which is a Poisson uh, model. So I'm uh, with a log link. So I'm modeling uh, the number of deaths with a population estimate. Uh, the inclusion. Now uh, we're looking at the relationship between temperature and mortality mortality rates. The inclusion of the additional uh, factors is to prevent confounding. So one might wonder why have, uh, why have a month and mean temperature? Surely they, they're, they're picking up the same thing. Not so. Uh, they're, they are slightly different in, insofar that month is more of a proxy for seasonality than temperature as, uh, as such. Uh, seasonality, by that I mean in that uh, uh, seasonality uh, which might arise if mortality uh, has been higher in winter months due to the prevalence of certain diseases. So a flu epidemic or even, uh, uh, which I think, cardiovascular disease. Um, the year captures general improvements in mortality over time, such as lifestyle, so they're needed to, so that we can actually pick up that relationship between mortality rate and temperature, so that in temperature it's not being confused with everything else. And here are the results. Pictures. Pictures are always good. Uh, so what, we're, what I'm going to focus in on is males. I did do this exercise for females as well, but for the purposes of this pre presentation, I'm going to look at males. You do see the same sort of general uh, trend uh, arising in the uh, females. Uh, the, uh, the differences are uh, slightly different, or the magnitude of the differences are slightly different, but you can take away the same thing. So here I have England, Wales, and Scotland. So uh, in the upper, upper left-hand corner, we have the age factor, so the effect of age on mortality. And for both England and Scotland, in both uh, the first decade and the second decade, as, as we would expect, it increases linearly. And looking at the year, which is uh, bottom right, uh, so bottom right for England and Wales and bottom right for Scotland, it is decreasing, although you see, kind of notice that the trajectory is more pronounced for England and Wales. The kind of interesting thing here is to look at month. So month being bottom left uh, for England and Scotland, uh, in both cases, in this decade, it's curved. 
you see a curved relationship, so high winter mortality. In the next decade, it's flattened out. And uh, again, that speaks of deseasonalization, uh, or more of an effective response to cardiovascular disease, better health care being, uh, being provided to tackle that particular, uh, particular disease. Um, and now the one that we're interested in, uh, temperature, which is top right uh, in both cases. In the first decade, you see the ink, it, it's sort of curving. Uh, but particularly for England and Wales, it's sort of curving. Uh, uh, but uh, the error bounds are quite pronounced because there's insufficient data at those higher temperatures. Move on to the next decade, and we see that the temperature data uh, available at higher temperatures in respect of England and Wales has increased. So that curve it doesn't have as much error bounds as the previous year. I know it's a bit tricky to say. Uh, to see that, but trust me. So then the question arises, if there is that data, uh, higher temperature data related to older ages, uh, how can we test that? It, the model seems to be suggesting that that U-shaped relationship certainly is persistent in England and Wales, not so Scotland. Scotland hasn't reached those temperatures. Scotland hasn't reached those higher temperatures that England and Wales uh, is reaching in the second decade. So it's sort of lagging behind. Uh, what does that mean for the mortality disparity then? Uh, so uh, what we did was to use information from the uh, UK climate change projections. It predicts by uh, 2050, uh, the temperature range uh, in respect of winter and summer would be that. So, uh, uh, so that for England and Wales and that for Scotland under a medium emission scenario. In fact, if you look at those climate change projections, they tend to be the same temperature whether it's a low, medium or high emission scenario, but we won't, say, we won't mention that. So what really sort of uh, becomes interesting is what's happening at the higher end of that uh, temperature range. That's kind of what we're interested in. And what does that mean for the relationship or the differences between England and Wales and Scotland? So uh, the current here, uh, so England and Wales, 4.7 uh, degrees Celsius. And I'm using January as a proxy month for winter uh, to put it into my model. So I'm sort of saying, if in 2014 we had those temperatures, what would that, uh, what impact would that have on the relative difference in mortality. So the current scenario is that the temperature, the difference in temperature is 1.3 degrees Celsius, and there is a 15% uh, relative difference in mortality, i.e. Scottish mortality is 15% higher in winter. Uh, uh, scenario two uh, reaffirms that there's little change, it's just moved slightly, but not so much. It's scenario two which is interesting. And what that is suggesting is that in winter, the mortality gap is expected to widen. And yet, uh, now we go into temperature. Uh, and uh, in some ways, that's not, uh, that's not so unexpected. Uh, warming temperatures or do augur well for mortality. So if England is getting warmer at a faster rate than Scotland, then the, the, the disparity should increase. Um, it's in summer that we see, see something uh, slightly interesting. And uh, if you recall, I said uh, central England was warming at a faster rate than Scotland. And so when you uh, think of that in terms of that U-shaped uh, relationship, it's, reach, it's going into that zone where mortality is accelerating. So we're looking at scenario two versus Current scenario one is still more or less the same, but it's scenario two when the temperature has increased uh, significantly so uh, in England and Wales, and Scotland remains in that optimal range. The optimal range is about uh, 15 to 20 degrees. Uh, 18 would be great, uh, i.e. it's the kind of temperature we're not having at this moment in time. Um, and what you see is that mortality in England and Wales accelerates. But in Scotland, it does not. So in summer, the mortality gap is expected to widen. And summary, 
There is a temperature range such that mortality is higher on either side of this optimal range, and with warming temperatures, regional temperature disparities are anticipated to change. And generally, this means what I've just said. Uh, I, I, I need to make a few qualifications in that it is a simple model. It does uncover certain things, but uh, the amount of deviance that's explained by temperature is small but significant. Uh, you might perhaps need a more complex model, introduce interactions to kind of uh, draw some of that, uh, draw that out. Uh, what is the relationship between um, uh, age and temperature? Uh, a very, the very elderly may be most impacted by changes in weather, whereas uh, the elderly uh, sort of uh, in, in the or sort of around 70s or so may not be that much. Uh, impacted. And so you have to consider those, um, uh, those interactions and that would help to improve the model and we are looking ahead to doing that. And I suppose if this is a question for you rather than me. Um, I'm, not a, a health, I'm not a sort of a general insurance person, I'm more mortality, so uh, I'm asking you what are the uh, risk management implications are, or does that herald uh, a change in perhaps how you design your products, uh, or might it in the future. Uh, so that's one for you. Um, and I'd like to t uh, thank all of these people, Louise and Terry, for their uh, support and input. Uh, Dr. Mary Wall who's, uh, and Shane Whelan, who, who are my co-supervisors, and Mary, in fact, co-authored this paper with me, and the Institute and, uh, and Faculty of Actors, as well as the Society of uh, actuaries of Ireland, they got me here, I, they paid me the money, uh, so uh, that's why uh, I ended up in the shard this morning watching the views, in, uh, watching the tennis uh, uh, on the 70th floor with the sun shining on me, so let's not mention that though. <laughs> so uh, if you have any uh, questions and comments, that would be great. Obviously forgotten that this is recorded, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So yeah, question over there please, and name first before the question, thank you. Uh, so Chris Reynolds, um, thanks very much for the paper Rabia, um, I, I particularly like a paper, an actual paper that mentions R, so that got me a little bit excited. Um, to, you talked about potentially making a more sophisticated model, and I was wondering whether you'd thought about actually including um, socioeconomic factors in there, something like IMD or, or SEG or s something like that. Absolutely. Uh, like there, are, there are a number of variables that you could include in there, because, uh, if, for example, the year variable is taking up a lot of things that are going on, and as you say, uh, including other variables might be helpful to that. Um, if, however, you might uh, get the situation where, like temperature, it sort of records a little shift in change, uh, small but significant, uh, so you kind of have to balance that out. Uh, with general, with GAM framework, uh, you're supposed to, it's supposed to, theoretically, it's not supposed to require interactions, but including higher order terms, um, uh, getting a handle on some of those um, uh, those interactions that are nested in there uh, and including other variables to get that uh, would be useful, I think. Question over here. Hello, my name is Adele Groyer. Thanks to your paper. I noticed on one of the slides the downward sloping trend by increasing temperature, and you did mention lack of data. So could you perhaps expand on the confidence you have on projecting further increases in temperature given the lack of data there? And a second question, um, you've worked with monthly averages. Is there any research out there about sudden spikes within a month followed by sudden drops? Um, so, uh, for the first part, uh, there's a lack of data because you wouldn't, because it is monthly mean temperature as opposed to daily temperature or anything like that. Uh, you, it, it would be, what's the word? Um, you, you're not going to see spikes in that type of data. Uh, but 
how, how soon am I going to get more and more uh, uh, data at the sort of higher ends? Uh, that's questionable. However, when looking at the data itself and how they define acute events, you certainly saw in the, uh, the uh, five-year period from 2010 to 2014 that the number of acute events uh, has increased uh, dramatically from what the expected number should be. Uh, and in fact, those acute events, both heat and cold, are kind of occurring throughout the year. So it's not even that it's, it's occurring solely in winter or solely in summer. You see that deseasonalization and you see higher temperatures. And certainly there is also a report out there that looks at, uh, as they've uh, sort of uh, defined it, H++ and L++ events. And they kind of look at, whereas the climate change projections, they're probabilistic. Uh, they only look at a certain um, range. Uh, these higher end sort of uh, report looks at the range outside of that, so very much in the tails. And it predicts temperatures of 40, uh, 40 degrees Celsius. So that is possible. Uh, and that's a winter, or sorry, a summer temperature, not just, uh, you know, one, uh, not just, uh, uh, it's an acute event, but uh, that could become the norm as we're, rapidly finding out here and in Dublin as well, temperatures are very much on the rise. So, did I answer your question? I, I, I don't think it's, it's possible to, um, you can create scenarios and you, what you can do is sort of amend the model and perhaps uh, input into it certain different rates of changes. But you have to set a limit as to what you can, what kind of temperature you can use or cannot use. And that has to be based on uh, projections that have been done. But certainly it is possible to do that. Hi, I'm Mei Chan from UCL. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, so you showed us uh, from your model the uh, mortality improvement yeah. um, results. And I was wondering if you've compared that to overall mortality improvement rates for those countries. And if there is something that you can say from your model about how much uh, the degree to which mean temperature, mean monthly temperature accounts for uh, mortality improvements. The, the, how much it accounts for the deviance in explaining the mortality or the rate of mortality change is small, but it is it taking that uh, to be a significant amount. Uh, the reason I would sort of qualify that even further is that it being a simple model, it doesn't include those interaction terms, which I think would be very helpful in teasing out really what is the impact of temperature. But um, to, to be honest, uh, there is a temperature uh, sort of uh, disease relationship, but uh, the deseasonalization has occurred, not because temperature has increased, but because uh, the healthcare system, particularly with respect to cardiovascular disease, which was the biggest killer, it, it has combated that. And so uh, in previous years, high winter mortality wasn't really because of low temperatures, it was because uh, cardiovascular disease was very prevalent. So you have to kind of qualify those things. Is, is that something you could uh, incorporate in a future model? Please. Sure. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> uh, question from Louise. Yeah, just, just a, a quick one, talking about looking at um, sort of not just monthly average temperatures, but, but episodes of, of high temperature. And yeah. That's, I'm just putting a bit of a plug in here. That's exactly the sort of thing that the Actuaries Climate Index will help with. No, exactly. Uh, uh, so so, so um, I, if, if we can make that available, yeah. that, that, that might enable you to have an easy way of building these sorts of things. No, uh, absolutely. And the model that I was kind of... Uh, doing in, in fact, there's sort of a little section where I think I just lost my courage, uh, and, and that's why I didn't kind of put it in the paper and just kind of alluded to the possible temperatures that could be done. But certainly, that is something that I'm looking to do to model those acute events. And uh, the fact is, the data suggests that those acute events are increasing in frequency and intensity. 
So it may not be that it, it occurs all year round, but it's that they occur uh, for a short period of time and may be very intense. And so that would be very interesting to do. Good. I'll do it like everything. <laughs> Good plug that was. Well done. Um, any other questions? A last question before we move on? Okay, again, thank you very much. So our third session is from uh, Lisa Altman Richer from Bupa. So Lisa currently works in pricing and actuarial department for Bupa in the UK. She's a student member of the IFOA. And prior to her work in the actuarial profession, she studied for an MSc in international health policy at the LSE. Her master's thesis focused on the role of physical activity tracking in private insurance, and this has formed the foundation for her current research for the IFOA. So over to Lisa. Thanks for that introduction, Nick. And before I get started, I'd also, I'd also like to thank my mentor, Ian Collier, who has helped guide me for my short research paper for this evening, and also Anna Spender for her additional input, as well as all the IFOA staff, Marie, Chantal, and Amanda in particular, who have helped to facilitate the event this evening. So I'd just like a quick show of hands for who in the room has ever used a physical activity tracker device? So that's any wearable device that tracks your steps. That's great. So probably about half of you, and I can see a few of you have raised your hand even wearing your devices today, which is even better. But for the other half of you who didn't put your hands up, that might well be set to change because the wearables market is a growing market that's forecast to more than double in size by 2020. And a large part of the growth in this market is going to be in the physical activity tracker industry, which is predicted to have a market value of 6 billion US dollars by 2020. So this provides us with a real opportunity to use wearables, such as physical activity trackers, as tools to improve health. And so I think it's really important that we as actuaries today start to think about how we want this technology to become embedded in the insurance industry over time. And so, motivated by this, I undertook some research into the policy implications and opportunities of the use of physical activity trackers by insurers. And it's these that I'd like to share with you over the next 15 minutes and I'm going to split this out into the short-term, medium-term, and long-term potential policy implications of this technology. So, as a starting point for my research, I wanted to gain more insight into our current understanding of the long-term relationship between physical activity and non-communicable disease. And when I say non-communicable <coughs> disease, I mean chronic diseases, and I carried out a systematic literature review that looked in, the, in particular at the relationship between physical activity and the five chronic diseases that are the most prevalent and expensive for insurers to treat. So these are cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, cancer, diabetes, and mental illness. And so, based on a keyword search, I retrieved more than 1,000 articles for screening. And I narrowed these down to 77 studies based on a number of inclusion criteria, the most important of which is that these studies had to look at the longitudinal relationship between physical activity and risk of developing a chronic disease. And the studies I looked at had to be at least one year in length so we could really start to focus on this long-term relationship between physical activity and health. Now, these 77 studies actually revealed a number of limitations in our current understanding of the relationship between physical activity and disease that I think will have to be overcome in the short term if insurers are going to be able to use physical activity trackers as tools to either set premiums or improve the health of their customers. 
So the first or the most crucial of these limitations is the fact that all 77 studies used self-reported measures of physical activity rather than objectively measured physical activity that you get from using a physical activity tracker. And this is a problem because although when people fill out their activity questionnaires, they might not intentionally mean to misreport, none of us here are great at objectively judging our own performance. And research has shown that correlations between objective measures of physical activity on the one hand and self-reported measures on the other are only in the order of around 0.6. So this means I think it will be really important that over the short term, insurers start to incentivize the uptake of physical activity trackers so that they can collect more objectively measured physical activity data and they can collect this directly on their insurance population of interest. And in fact, we're already seeing insurers starting to do this by handing out free activity trackers to their customers or providing them with discounted premiums or other awards like a free cinema tickets if they engage actively with this technology. However, simply encouraging uptake of the most popular devices as they are at present is unlikely to, to be sufficient to build up a very reliable picture of the relationship between physical activity and risk of developing a chronic disease. And this is because at present, the accuracy of the devices that are available are questionable. So research has shown that measurements between devices can differ by up to 20%. And in fact, these devices aren't great at capturing all forms of physical activity. So I'm a keen swimmer, and on days I go swimming, although my activity tracker might record 3,000 steps, I'll have actually done another hour's worth of physical activity in the pool. And in addition to improving accuracy of these devices, it will also be important to improve the validity of the data from these devices. So if you do a quick search on YouTube for how you can get 10,000 steps on your activity tracker without even leaving the sofa, you'll see a number of suggestions, my favorite of which is shown here, which is you can simply give your activity tracker to your dog who can take it for a walk on your behalf. And so this points to real need for insurers to start to build in validation systems that helps prevent fraudulent use of these devices, particularly if discounted insurance premiums are going to be started to be offered to those customers that achieve the most physical activity. Fortunately, there does appear to be a short-term solution emerging to this problem. So medical grade wearable devices are starting to come to market for consumer wearables and these medical grade devices are much more accurate at recording levels of physical activity. And this improved accuracy could even serve as a biometric fingerprint that helps to stamp down on fraudulent use of these devices. So encouraging uptake of medical grade wearables in the short term seems really important. Now, although I mentioned some limitations to our current understanding between physical activity and risk of developing a non-communicable disease, the research that I undertook in, with the systematic literature review did find that 84% of studies showed that increased levels of physical activity are associated with decreased levels of developing a chronic disease. And this is even when controlling for other factors such as BMI, weight, blood pressure, and socioeconomic status. So this means, in the medium term, once medical grade wearables have been used in order to gather more objectively measured physical activity data that can refine our understanding of the link between physical activity and risk of developing disease, there's a real opportunity for insurers to use the data from activity trackers in order to class policyholders according to their health risks. And by this I mean charging a more expensive premium to the less physically active and a cheaper premium to the more physically active based upon an individual's corresponding risk of developing a chronic disease. And in fact, physical activity may just be the starting point because we're starting to see a number of medical grade wearables being developed that 
not only record physical activity, but also track a wider range of health-related variables as well. For example, the company Biotricity is developing the BioLife medical grade wearable that can not only track physical activity, but it can also track body temperature, respiration rates, and ECG as well. And so the way that insurers start to use physical activity data to class policyholders could set a precedent for the way that the data from these more sophisticated wearable devices are used by the industry over the medium term. However, although insurers may be really keen to class policyholders according to their health risks, policymakers, on the other hand, may look to implement risk smoothing policies in order to help prevent customers from being priced out of the insurance market. So, policymakers may be keen to ensure that the less physically active or the otherwise less healthy, and those people that can't afford a wearable device, or those people that choose for personal reasons not to share their data from their wearable device with their insurer, policymakers will want to ensure that these people are not discriminated against by facing prohibitively high insurance premiums that prevent them from accessing the market. And this tension between classing on the one hand and risk smoothing on the other is already evident in the insurance industry. So I'm sure many of you were directly impacted in your day-to-day -day work by the ban on gender segregation of premiums that the EU implemented. And this is an example of a risk smoothing policy. Whereas black box technology and its use by the motor insurance industry in order to charge premiums to motorists according to the times of day and the routes that they drive is an example of how insurers are using more sophisticated forms of classing to help circumvent some of these risk smoothing policies. So in fact, the policy response to the use of physical activity trackers by insurers could set a really important precedent for the way that the data for more sophisticated wearable health tech is actually able to be used by the industry going forwards. Now, so far, we've taken a rather static view of physical activity. So we've said that because I walk, let's say, 6,000 steps a day on average, my risk of developing a chronic disease is greater than, let's say, Nick's risk because he walks 11,000 steps a day on average. And so I'll have a more expensive health insurance premium than Nick will. But over the long term, there's an opportunity to move away from this fatalistic approach and towards a behavioral change approach. And the behavioral change approach sees health risks as amenable to intervention. So just because I walk 6,000 steps a day on average today doesn't mean that over time I can't be encouraged to increase my levels of physical activity and thus reduce my corresponding risk of developing a chronic disease. However, it's really important that behavioral change is brought about in the most effective and sustainable way. Now, Ryan and Desi's self-determination theory discusses two different mechanisms by which people can be motivated to change their behaviors. The first of these is extrinsic motivation. And extrinsic motivation uses external stimuli to encourage people to undertake particular activities. So if I were to offer each of you 20 pound for every day over the next month that you walk 10,000 steps, that's surely going to motivate a lot of you to increase your levels of physical activity. And this is because you'll be motivated by the external motivator of the 20 pounds. However, what Ryan and Desi theorize is that external motivation is unable to bring about long-term sustained changes in behavior. And this is because, returning to our example of the, of the 20 pounds, over the month, as it progresses, this incentive to, to get your 20 pounds a day is likely to seem less and less attractive, and you're likely to forget about how strong this motivator is. And of course, when the month ends and there's no longer any monetary incentive in it for you to walk your 10,000 steps a day, most of you will just lapse back to your original patterns of physical activity. And we can see this empirically as well. So if you think back to last summer's craze of Pokemon Go, many people, myself included, 
were encouraged to increase their levels of physical activity by the extrinsic motivator of catching Pokemon. And research published in the BMJ by researchers at Harvard University has shown that although initially players of the game did increase their levels of physical activity by about 1,000 steps a day on average, over time, the motivator of catching Pokemon was not strong enough to sustain these increased levels of physical activity. And so by week six, their levels of physical activity had reduced back to their baseline levels. And findings like these are particularly problematic because at the moment, ways that we're using physical activity trackers to encourage people to walk more and do more activity actually appeal predominantly to extrinsic motivation. So if any of you have ever joined a Fitbit challenge or some other activity tracker challenge where you're competing with friends to increase your number of steps, that competition is actually an extrinsic motivator. And I mean, I speak personally, there's nothing more unmotivating than never being able to top that person that's got 25,000 steps on the leaderboard. And to be honest, they probably just lent their physical activity tracker to their dog to get that as well. And in fact, the incentives being implied by insurers at the moment also appeal to extrinsic motivation. So some insurers are offering discounted premiums or other rewards like free coffee for those insurers that reach certain step goals such as 10,000 steps a day. And these are external motivators, which means that they are going to be less effective at actually bringing about long-term sustained changes and increases in physical activity that could actually reduce the disease burden over the long term. Fortunately, though, the other side of self-determination theory focuses on the intrinsically motivating stimuli. And Ryan and Desi theorize that these are more effective at sustaining long-term increases in behavior or changes in behavior. And so over the long term, there's a real opportunity for insurers to pioneer intrinsically motivating strategies by collaborating with other stakeholders in the wearables ecosystem, such as health professionals, policymakers, and IT developers. And the way that intrinsic motivation works is it actually communicates to the individual the reason behind why they would want to change their behavior. So with the example of physical activity, it will be about communicating to people all the health benefits that increased levels of physical activity can bring them, and also helping to support them through the process of incrementally increasing their physical activity by helping to set realistic goals that they can achieve gradually over time. And I'd be happy to, of course, talk about my vision for the role of each of these stakeholders in this ecosystem in the Q&A session in a sec. But for now, I'd just like to say that I hope you can see that as actuaries, we have a potentially really important role to play in all this in terms of the fact that we need to bring about data-driven behavioral change. So it will be really important that we analyze the data that we're getting from wearable devices in order to deduce which methods of motivation are most effective for which different population subgroups at helping them to improve their behavior. And ultimately, this can bring about a reduction in the disease burden of society and thus improve the health of society as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll open up to questions then. So, got any questions on the floor? Go over there. Again, if we can have names first and then the question, please. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's Scott Reid. Uh, Lisa, th thanks very much for the paper. It's really, this is something I'm interested in um, personally because I do quite a lot of running. So. <laughs> um, just a, I've actually got two questions. Did you come across any research published by the actual Fitbit trackers, like Fitbit and other brands that have actually, what are they actually doing with the data and have they published any findings of their research? And my second question is around, obviously insurers and healthcare professionals have got interests aligned here in try, trying to improve the nation's health. Um, have you got any thoughts on how these two you know, insurers and healthcare professionals can work together? Sure. So on your first point, there are some studies that I think 
since 2016 uh, or, and over the beginning of this year as well that have started to emerge to look at directly the physical activity data coming from the likes of Fitbit to see if these improve health. But most of them are not greater than one year in length, so there's really no indication of the long-term benefit of this. And the ones that I have come across as well don't appear to demonstrate that there is actually a, a link between increased levels of physical activity and reduced risk of disease. So obviously it's in a very short time frame, but so far there's no evidence that I've come across that points to the fact that simply giving someone a Fitbit to track their device, to track their physical activity will actually improve their health. Uh, and that may be because people aren't being motivated in the right way while they're using these devices and that they're not to answer your second point, that they're not receiving you know, support from health professionals. So there was one study in particular which seemed to show that giving someone a Fitbit could actually be detrimental to their ability to lose weight because when they had the Fitbit, they did less physical activity than those people that didn't have a Fitbit but went to regular sessions with a health professional to help guide them through how to be healthier. And these people did also attend the sessions as well with the health professionals, but the sort of the, the feeling that they were doing enough simply by wearing the Fitbit is what the research has found. And you know, I'd be happy to share some links to those papers um, with you later as well. And in terms of how we can incentivize people or insurers to collaborate with health professionals, um, I think there's a real need for maybe policies to encourage this because at present people can switch insurers pretty easily. So in terms of encouraging insurers to invest in the long-term health of their customers, there's not a strong enough incentive because that customer might not be developing a chronic disease until 30 years down the line, but meanwhile they could have gone off to another rival insurer. And so I think sort of stronger policy incentives in that direction could be a big help in that area. Yeah, so in, that could definitely be a point um, to consider. So some of these studies, or one of the studies, would be having given wearable devices to, to corporate um, customers that have self-selected, whereas in the particular study I mentioned about the um, sort of weight loss trial, these were people that were not very physically active, that were spent, like selected um, randomly in order to participate in the study. So. Yeah, it's fine. I think that I have come across one finding um, that physical activity could potentially long-term reduce risk of disease based on objectively measured physical activity. But then, of course, that was from an insurer that was in, in partnership with a wearable provider. So we have to be a bit sceptical about that as well. <laughs> Hello, I'm Anne. Um, thank you, Lisa. That was really interesting. Um, from a health insurance perspective, I was wondering what do you think the short-term impact is on acute conditions like MSK? Like, do you think increasing physical activities could actually increase MSK claims, for example? So, thanks for your question, Anne. I think that's a really interesting point, and I think it will be definitely something that insurers need to be aware of when they're going out and encouraging people to walk 10,000 steps a day, which is a very arbitrary target, that these targets aren't going to be suitable for everyone. So, you know, a, an overweight 50 year old would need a very different exercise program to a 20 year old who does quite a lot of exercise. And so I think the current focus of the market is a bit misguided in simply encouraging everyone to achieve the same target of physical activity. And hopefully it will be interesting to see more data collected around this as to how this potentially impacts on, on injuries within um, the corporate world primarily and also more generally other customers. But I think with a more collaborative approach by collaborating with health professionals and others in the ecosystem, there could be a real opportunity to help prevent some of these injuries like MSK injuries through the use of these devices. Got a question over there. 
Uh, Andy Jinks, um, thanks for that, that's really interesting. Um, in the UK, most people don't have uh, private health insurance and rely on the NHS. Was uh, uh, anything in the studies that sort of talked about, that looked at the interaction between the Fitbits and reliance on public health service, or do you have any views on where that might, you know, that might be of use in the future? Sure. So, I mean, the studies I looked at weren't just UK specific, they were very general, but in terms of the sort of ecosystem I presented to you, I think a key stakeholder is going to be policymakers because there is a huge risk that, as you say, only those people that can afford private medical insurance will be the ones that are going to be encouraged to improve their behaviour through these devices. So I think some more, a more general approach um, where policymakers can help perhaps collaborate with the NHS in addition to private insurance could help to prevent social inequity arising whereby you have a two-tier health system that the, private, the privately health insured are getting fitter and fitter under this guidance and then those that can't afford a wearable device or private insurance are sort of left behind. Okay, I think one last question then, please. Uh, Mohammed Hashimi. Um, well, <clears throat> I just uh, want to comment on the NHS thing. Um, I know that um, the NHS is trying to use some of the uh, health technologies, um, so some of the health apps. There's some, uh, some of the um, uh, clinical commissions, uh, they already commissioned the use of health apps in, the, in, in some uh, neighborhoods in London. Um, and then, uh, well, it's a vision that in the future, in the next 10 years, um, well, everything will be augmented. There will not be wearable technology anymore. Uh, our reality will be where everything happening. And uh, bots will be telling us what is healthy. And it would be a personalized um, apps. So like it would measure your heartbeat and everything. So it will be tells you what exactly is suitable for yourself to do. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think I'm one of the key stakeholders, which I mentioned, were IT developers who are going to play a really important role in ensuring that this technology can be centralised and that all the different players in the ecosystem, such as the health professionals, the insurers, the NHS, can collaborate together and there's definitely the opportunity for people to have their own personalised medical record available that they can share around with their doctors that sort of has tracked a, a long history of their variables like heart rate and blood pressure over time. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. So, uh, last but not least, we have Nay Wynn from Hanover Life Re. Uh, Nay's a research actuary at Hanover Re UK Life Branch. His responsi responsibilities include reviewing and updating the central basis for the major product lines. He has a strong interest in critical illness trends and is keen on developing a number of what-if scenarios and working through their potential impacts on the insurance industry. He recently published a front cover article in the Actuary magazine entitled, What If There Was a Cure For Cancer? And I was there when he gave a plenary talk at Protection Health and Care Conference uh, this year. So, uh, Nay, over to you. Slightly low on energy, but I'll go through this. Uh, so yeah, what, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, what if, artificial organs were sufficient enough to replace the need for donors. Uh, that's the subject. Um, I tried to come up with a snappier title, but uh, I don't think I succeeded there. So I'll get straight into it. In terms of the agenda, um, I'll go through a brief history of, the organ, tran of organ transplants. Uh, that will take us right down to where we are now. Uh, we'll look at why the, organ, uh, why the waiting list exists. Uh, in particular uh, by looking at the demand side and the supply side of organs. Uh, finally, uh, there'll be a uh, section on the impact on the CI and term assurance products. Uh, so that'll be split by short term, medium term, long term, and then I'll uh, conclude nicely at the end. So in terms of the history, uh, any guesses on the first documented case of an organ transplant? Uh, I'm guessing you're all very tired. Um, you, you should guess in thousands of years. I was quite surprised. It's uh, 3,000 years ago. There was a documented case, a very well-documented case, on skin transplants in India. The uh, Indian surgeon there actually um, created a compendium 
of, of all the surgery and uh, surgical procedures uh, covered about 184 chapters um, with over a thousand diseases covered. So very, very detailed there. Um, these, uh, so this was a skin transplant um, to help um, deal with um, damage to the nose. Uh, skin was taken from somewhere else and placed on. Uh, there wasn't much of an issue with rejection because it was um, the same person. So um, there wasn't any organ rejection issues, which we'll come to. Uh, in uh, the 16th century, these techniques were revised in Italy. In terms of sort of organs that I tend to think about, the, the full-blown organs rather than the skin, the first documented case uh, was in 1906 uh, in France. Um, history becomes a little fuzzy here because it depends on whether you're talking about um, animal to animal transplantation or animal to human or human to human. Um, and it also depends what the reason for transplant is. I've decided to look at transplants to treat organ failure. So this is the first uh, documented case. Um, there were two patients. Uh, one was using, uh, one transplant took place with a pigged kidney, the other one with a goat kidney. Uh, survival times are very poor, so one survived for three days after the other eight days. And the main issue was organ rejection, uh, transferring from animals to human, there's obviously that issue. And they didn't really have dialysis machines then, so there wasn't any real alternatives. The first successful uh, transplant using human donors was in Kiev, Poland. Oh. Skipped ahead. Um, this was um, successful in the sense that the transplanted organ uh, functioned in terms of producing urine, um, but it wasn't successful because the patient only survived for two days. Uh, a number of reasons were cited. Uh, the donor kidney wasn't well preserved. Uh, there was a mismatch of blood group, and uh, there was the patient was actually a, uh, a lady who tried to commit suicide by ingesting mercury. So um, the conclusion from the autopsy was the mercury has done too much damage. We'd have to wait until 1954 for a, a truly successful uh, kidney transplant. And it was successful because uh, it was done on identical twins, uh, two brothers. Um, the transplanted patient actually survived for eight years afterwards. Um, and the reason for that is because there was no issue with organ rejection. The blood groups and all of that matched. And next is liver transplants. Uh, the first successful case where the person lived for more than a year was in 1967. Um, there, there's a bit of history with um, trial and errors uh, prior to those years. And the main way that it evolved to be successful here is um, that they managed to um, use immunosuppressants, um, so suppress that. Uh, patient's immune system, which means that it didn't reject the organ. The first successful human heart transplant was performed in South Africa. I think a few people know this already. Uh, it was done by Dr. Christian Bernard, the brother of Marius Bernard, who uh, introduced the dread disease, which is now the critical illness product. Um, the outcome, similar to all the others, um, it was successful. The heart performed dysfunction. However, the survival time was poor. The patient survived 18 days. It was only until the 1980s that survival time started improving because of improvements in technology. So that takes us sort of to where we are now. Um, in terms of survival rates, uh, it's quite astonishing, really, because we're talking about one-year survival rates in 2011, 2014 of around 93% for kidneys. Um, I think that's just remarkable because, you, you know, you, when you need a kidney transplant, you're really close to death. You, your organ has failed. Both organs have failed. Um, so to be able to transplant another human's kidney into you and then survive for at least a year, and if you look to the graph on the right, the survival time for kidney, five years survival rates, is 90%. So that's quite, quite staggering. Um, the summary of that slide is that improvement, there's been improvements in one-year survival rates, even higher improvements in the five-year survival rates. Uh, if we turn our attention to the um, waiting list, um, this is a graph just to summarize the situation that we're in in the UK. Um, the line uh, corresponds to the uh, vertical axis on the right. We've got around 6,500 people on the waiting list. The gold bars are the number of donors. Uh, the blue bars are the number of transplants. So I read somewhere that one 
human donor can uh, save up to eight lives, so one for heart, one for lungs, etc. Um, looking at this, we're looking, and that's actually um, in perfect condition, so we find perfect matches and everything fits according to plan. Uh, in reality, we're looking at one person, one donor there saving about um, three lives. So the number of lives on the waiting list is nearly double the number on, of transplants taking place. And the issue really is that the demand is so, so much higher than the supply. And that's quite a sad thing because in 2015 to 2016, there were 479 people on the waiting list that died. So, because they haven't found a match. And that's around 7.5% of those on the waiting list. So I've alluded to this. Uh, why does the waiting list exist? It's just more demand than supply. Demand, demand side factors, so there'll be your lifestyle habits or your diseases that you may pick up, uh, accidents, and also senescence. Senescence is the, the general aging process. And so you can get wear and tear on your organs and eventually need an organ replacement. In terms of the supply, you've got human donors, uh, xenotransplantation, which is from animal sources, uh, artificial organs, which we'll touch on, and the national organ donation stance that could have an impact on the overall supply. Um, there is another uh, point in here uh, which I haven't included. It's the, the NHS budget. Um, so that's the austerity measures and, and, and how much is given to NHS. That has an impact because it could uh, reduce the number of surgeons available, number of nurses available, number of resources available. Um, I haven't mentioned this because the NHS budget side is more of a political thing and that can vary. And also NHS is UK to, unique to UK. Uh, in terms of the demand, if you look at it in a bit more detail, um, you, if, you've got, if you excessively take drugs or alcohol, that will increase your risk of liver disease, uh, kidney disease. Uh, if you smoke a lot, then you'll need lungs eventually if, if your lungs fail. Um, poor diet and obesity can lead to, um, a, a, need, lead to you requiring heart, uh, heart transplant. Uh, obesity could also lead you to uh, develop diabetes, which in turn will require you to have a kidney transplant. Um, accidents, although the man magnitudes of accidents are very low in the UK uh, relative to what they were 50 plus years ago, um, poisoning and physical trauma still does happen and in those cases you would need an urgent um, organ transplant. Again, senescence we've touched on. Um, just to give a brief overview, uh, in terms of the waiting list, those six and a half thousand, Around 78% of them are for kidneys, 9% uh, for liver, 6% for lungs, and 4% um, requiring heart transplants. Okay, in terms of the supply, 100% uh, of the uh, organ transplants are from human donors. Uh, the main issue there is organ rejection. Uh, you need to get everything matched up perfectly. Uh, the main issue there, again, is the availability of human organs. Uh, we mentioned before that immunosuppressants can be used to uh, reduce that risk of organ uh, rejection, um, but it's a careful balance because if you start reducing, if you start suppressing the immune system and you then open the patient to risk of viral and bacterial infections, a careful balance is needed there. Uh, xenotransplantation has been a not a strong contender in the past. Um, the main issue was um, transferring. One is um, suitability. Um, a pig's heart is fairly similar to a human's heart, but then it's not perfect. Um, there are also um, issues with um, passing on viruses from animal sources. There's been a recent advance in um, gene editing tool using CRISPR. Um, there's been a, revival, a, a revived interest in this area. Um, an article in The Telegraph, published in January this year, uh, spoke about scientists inserting human stem cells into pig embryos and then letting the embryos to mature to three to four weeks to check the state of the, um, the, the heart. Uh, I think that's what they did it on. And uh, essentially, the aim is to breed pigs to grow hearts of human cell origin, in which case then you've sorted out um, you've sorted out the problem. I see a few oh my gods there. Uh, there are obviously ethical challenges. Um, perhaps, you know, we, we need to go through those first. 
but the, the, the impact is that it will be 100% human, so that chance of rejection is reduced, and also you can mass produce it. Um, we'll take a look at the artificial uh, organs on the next slide. Uh, just briefly mention organ donation stance. Um, <coughs> back in 2008, uh, the default stance was an opt-in stance. So if you wanted to donate an organ, you had to sign to a register and donate to say that you're happy to donate in case you die. Um, in 2008, the review uh, was carried out by Organ Donation Task Force. They said that it shouldn't, the opt-out um, stance shouldn't be uh, introduced in the UK at the present time. Uh, the reason for that is it's too costly, it may not increase uh, organ donation rates, and um, you could spend that money somewhere else and perhaps get a, get a, a better return on your money. Um, so currently, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland have an opt-in stance, so if you want to donate, you have to opt-in. Um, Wales have developed a soft opt-out system as of December 2005, which is essentially presumed consent. If you were to die, then they can harvest your organs. You can sign up to say, no, I don't want that. Um, obviously, that changes the scene, so the pool of organs that's available has massively increased. Um, I saw a few... Um, articles published on this, it has increased the number of uh, organs available and there was a, uh, an increase in the number of transplants taking place. Um, so perhaps we'll have another review in the UK, the rest of the UK. Okay, in terms of artificial organs, um, before I did this paper I had no idea how advanced human society was in treating organ failure or what technologies were available out there. Uh, in fact, um, I think it's quite advanced. Um, in terms of kidneys, the University of California, San Francisco, have created a, an artificial kidney, which is the size of a coffee cup. Um, and they are currently, um, so they've designed it and they've tested it on some level, um, and it does function well. And they are raising money, they raised seven million out of the eight million dollars they need. And once they've raised enough, they're hoping to start human trials, full human trials, um, this year, and then publish the results probably around 2020. And then we could start seeing these. And if you remember back, 78% um, of people on the waiting list are waiting for kidneys, so that's a huge valuable source there that could wipe out that waiting list. Um, the Wakefield Forest Baptist Medical Center, um, they have uh, been growing kidney cells and placing them into renal devices and implanting them in animals. That was quite successful, so they extended it to produce uh, said kidney using um, bio, uh, bio printing. So you can actually print that kidney out. They haven't done tests on this, but it does look really good. Um, and and um, bio printing, um, 3D printing is very advanced now. You can uh, print up to the capillaries, so up to nanometers, and you can ju just put in human cells, human stem cells, and they can form that, um, they can sort of take the shape of the organ around the already existing shape and function well, so that's very exciting. Um, the same company's been um, trying to set up uh, human cells to create a liver, but that's quite challenging. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of actual actually creating liver cells, we're currently stuck with ginormous machines, uh, large diastasis machines such as the Mars and Bell systems. Um, I've not really come across any, anyone that successfully created a very small um, uh, liver for artificial transplantation. Um, with the heart, um, I think that's the most exciting one, um, the Syncardia Total Artificial Heart uh, is currently used as a stopgap between um, those, um, those needing a heart but on the waiting list and eventually they'll get rid of your artificial heart and give you a real human heart um, when, when the, uh, the heart is available. Um, their marketing brochure uh, mentions that over 32 years of use, the, value, the valves in the artificial heart has never failed and they've done at least 1,700 implants and account, which accounted for more than 580 patient years of support. So the technology really is out there, and that's the picture of a heart. It's very small, and the wires go down, and you have sort of a pack 
that you carry with you. Um, and that's how the heart works. It's very similar to the real heart. They just mimic the pipes and the tubes in the correct way, so it's easy to transplant. So, are we on time? So I carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we come to the uh, impact on critical illness. Um, in the short term, I would argue we'd probably have no impact. So artificial organs, great as they are, they probably won't have any impact on the CI pricing. Um, the main reason is because of the wording uh, on the relevant condition, which is major organ transplant. In there, it says that a payout will be made um, if you're included on the official UK waiting list. So it really doesn't matter whether you have an artificial heart or a human heart, you'll get the payout regardless. So even though you've got loads of artificial hearts, it wouldn't affect the price. In 2014, the statement of best practice added a phrase, which is from another person. Um, that could have an impact in the medium or long term, um, which I'll get to now. So in the medium term, um, I would say probably around five to 25 years, the impact varies, um, actuarial. Um, it depends. So, so the availability and the reduced, organ, the reduced risk of organ rejection is the two main plus points for artificial organs. They could become then a preferred choice of organ transplants. The main argument for the impact to come about is that artificial organs will essentially wipe out the waiting list. In that case, then it matters whether your transplant is from a human source or an artificial source based on that current wording. Um, I did a bit of modeling, and the magnitude is fairly small. Uh, the reason is that major organ transplant rates itself is very small compared to the heart attack, cancer, and stroke risks. Um, so yeah, the, the impact varies, but it'll probably be small. In the long term, I, I would argue that the impact is much more significant. Oh, before I get to that, sorry. Um, th there's a few questions it raises. What about bio-artificial organs? So those are organs grown in a lab using human cells. Technically, it is not from an, uh, another donor, so technically you shouldn't pay out. Um, but then it is human cells. So wh where, where does the wording ally with that? Also, um, it could impact other CI conditions, so liver failure uh, CI definition and the lung failure CI definition, um, the rates there could be reduced. Um, just by applying artificial organs, organ transplants. So in the long term, I would argue uh, the impacts would be quite significant. Um, potentially, the artificial organ transplants could become quite a routine procedure. And you could get to a stage where um, you start to replace organs before the patient becomes so ill. And so this will be carried out on relatively healthy patients. It could also then start having impacts on cancer rates. So if you had a, a localized cancer in the liver, well, just replace your liver. You don't need to bother um, going through um, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Uh, so you could start reducing other uh, disease, uh, uh, rates of other diseases. The magnitude is uh, very uncertain. This is 25 plus years time. Uh, there's social impacts, cultural impacts you've got to take into account, um, but potentially um, you could start reducing the price of CI. On term, the impact is quite straightforward. Uh, the main argument is uh, that instead of the person dying right there, uh, they can die maybe four years later because they would have an artificial heart in, in place. Um, the Syncardia artificial heart system, a person lived for four years before they received, an artificial, um, before they received a human heart. So effectively, the, the argument is the delaying of death, so you could get mortality improvements in the short term. Again, the impact will be small because organ transplant, um, people needing organ transplants are few and far between. Medium term impact, um, the same argument applies, it's just a little bit stronger. In the long term, um, as I said on the CI, uh, if you start reducing the rates of your, reducing the chance of death from cancers, you start curing cancers then, or delaying that um, by having a, an artificial liver, artificial lung, uh, in that case then you could start seeing mortality improvements 
uh, and that's that's all for now. So, oh no, I've got, I've got a conclusion for you. Uh, <laughs> so, in terms of the conclusion, uh, there are substantial advances in organ transplant technology. Um, artificial key, organs could be the key in solving the shortage of organs. Uh, the impact on uh, CI in term varies uh, massively. Um, in terms of what we can do now, I could only think of two questions. Uh, one was, should we review the current organ transplant definition? I know a review is currently taking place, I guess it's 2017, the last review is 2014. Um, and also, could advances in transplant technology help us create better insurance products? And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions. So if we've got the mics in. Anyone like to put their hand up? Again, please remember name first and then the question. Uh, this is, uh, Scott Reid. Uh, Nath, thanks very much for the, the presentation the paper. Um, it's, it's really just talking about the scenarios. It's a good idea to look at the scenarios of the future, you know, what can actually happen in the future. Um, the thing about the demand side, for example, um, would, for example, the artificial organ, organ transplantation became very common and very successful? Because you don't have this rejection issue you do have with the human organ transplantation. Do you think that would drive up greater demand for it, which could lead to a greater impact in the, you know, critical illness and other products? So the question was, um, would the, would the Using artificial organs lead to better data requirements. Better demand. Better demand. Oh yeah. Um, I, yeah. The I. It was quite tough because there are ethical concerns which doesn't, which are hard to judge, and it really depends on how far people in general take it. I mean, there, there are questions of sport as well. I mean, should you get a better artificial heart, and would they be allowed to compete? Um, but yeah, in, t in terms of the, the data side, I, it's quite, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, it's potentially. Uh, just a question, so given some of the incidents we've had with hearts with footballers recently, a link, link to Scott's point over there, that theoretically better screening, better review could lead to less incidents if they were more readily available and, well, if they were plastic. You know, then you could, everyone could have one who, was, who had a possible issue as a sportsman, I suppose. Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I, the, 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 the sort of governance around it will depend on how far artificial organs go. Um, I, I didn't mention this in my presentation, but there are other ways of, in terms of general medicine, there are other ways of um, treating organ failure, so you could have better advances in uh, immunotherapies, um, so you can treat cancer by that rather than replacing organs. Um, but maybe even in the longer term than 25 years, you could start seeing um, sort of cyborgs, you know, part machine, part man, sort of constructs walking about. So. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of imagining artificial organs having activity trackers built into them. Oh, nice. We can work together on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really scary thought. Um, okay, any other questions? Got one question over there, please. Uh, Nikki Edwards, um, just at the point that Louise said, um, there are actually some technologies out there that are starting to do that, so from a personal stance, I've got something called a spinal cord stimulator implanted because um, I've got nerve damage um, pain condition. Um, and as part of that, there's a geospatial tracker in that that can tell what position my body is in. So there are things in the medical world that will start to come, al come along and bring, be able to bring these things together, maybe not 30, 50 years down the line, but things are starting to go that way already. Uh, yeah, I guess... I that's really good to know, actually. Um, the, um, I guess the issue, again, on the governance side, whether insurers will be allowed to use that information and whether that's ethically allowed is, is a big question. Um, it's, it's good to, I guess it's the point of, um, of Lisa, whether you should um, classify people at, 
really personal level and offer the premium that matches their risk or their perceived risk or whether you should actually, it's fairer to combine risks. Um, it's a big challenge. I think we've got time for one more actually. There's one more out there. Okay, my only one, Nay, is um, I know you're saying every three years definitions change. Could it be quicker if we needed to? Could we be a little bit swifter if an, if an issue came up? Or do we have to say, oh, missed the boat three more years? That's, that's a qu good question, but outside my <laughs> station to answer. <laughs> it's worth a try. Okay. Um, so perhaps everyone could think about that one when they get back. Um, okay, so it's a. Uh, Brief summary, if everyone, oh, sorry, first of all, thank you very much to Nay. So now a brief summary, so we've had four, four excellent speeches, all very different, so um, if we can remember back to Louise, so um, the main bit that I got from hers is that it all depends. Um, and the one, the one bit that I definitely got out is the UK is definitely, definitely, definitely luckier than the US, in brackets possibly. Um, number two, <laughs> so uh, when we went over to Rabia, um, the, the difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK, very pronounced, um, with obviously the differences between the, the two mortality rates improving on the scenarios we've looked at. But the thing that I took away is uh, to beat England, Scotland need to burn a lot more coal. I think that's what we tried to say on that one. So that was, is that an output in your report? <laughs> there we go. You, you can have, yes. So, so the Scots in the room are writing that down quickly. Um, so thirdly, when we went over to Lisa, again, um, it's not a surprise to realise that catching Pokemon in Pokemon Go only lasted six weeks as an interest. <laughs> So we needed a little bit more of an external stimuli there. Um, and the other bit is that Lisa will always be disheartened by the fact that I do 11,000 steps and she only does 6,000. So thanks for that. Um, and the last one from Nay, um, slightly depressing in the fact that instead of opting in to organ transplants, we're all going to rely on pigs for hearts. So um, that's a bit depressing, that one. So I'll be checking my card in my wallet later. So um, last thing I'd like to say is thank you very much to all four of our speakers. Um, and if we could do another round of applause for them, please.